Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chad Ward, one of our newest faculty members, has been with the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit since uh, November of last year. Dr. Ward is a graduate of the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. He continued his training in pediatrics at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, and fellowship training in pediatric critical care at the University of Tennessee Health System Sciences in Memphis. He has participated in numerous scholarly activities, including multiple publications, presentations locally and, nat and nationally, as well as QI initiatives. He currently serves on the Carilion Patient Safety and Pediatric Trauma QI committees. He has already been recognized in his previous roles for his teaching ability as well as his compassionate patient care and was the recipient of the Soul S O U L Care Award by Tallahassee Memorial Hospital. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chad Ward. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, the talk for Grand Rounds today that I'm presenting is entitled Chasing Hemostasis. We're going to be looking at how coagulopathy and traumatic brain injury, kind of the mystery with that. We'll talk about some of the hemostatic adjuncts, as well as transfusions, as well, and including a few other um, therapies. I currently have no disclosures, and I want to start off with a few cases. So I have four cases for us. The first one, um, and these are, you know, we're talking very severe traumatic brain injury with these patients, but the first one is a two-year-old female who was unfortunately ejected um, from the back seat through the front windshield. Now, she was down when she was found by EMS. She had a GCS of three. Uh, her vital signs included tachycardia, and she was very hypotensive, and she was cold. Um, the images that I've presented for you, especially the one on the left, you can see the, the significant nature of her injuries with the impressive skull fracture. Uh, the image, middle image, I'll draw your attention to the degree of just surrounding soft tissue swelling, as well as the degree of cerebral edema. There's poor gray-white differentiation. Now, the image on the far right, we see that the posterior horns of the ventricle um, actually have blood in them. So there's interventricular hemorrhaging as depicted here. Uh, as far as her laboratory data goes, she was, um, she had elevated white count. She was anemic. Um, normal platelets, she did have elevated liver enzymes. As you can see, she's got an elevated lactate. Other injuries with her multi-trauma included a femur fracture, pulmonary contusions. And because, you know, we weren't able to get an exam on her, the decision was made because her pupils were reacting that perhaps she was viable was to place an intracranial pressure monitor. Um, but as we're doing this, we see that her coags are very um, much out of range of normal, especially with an INR of 3.2. Well, let me go to the next case. I have to take it out of the annotate. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, the second case is a three-month-old who was found unresponsive. Uh, the child presents with uh, kind of tachycardia, hypertensive, and um, tachypnea. The image that you see on the left, you see that there is a subdural hematoma on the patient's um, frontal right region. Um, you can also see that on the sagittal as well. Um, laboratory data shows that the patient is anemic, thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 30, and there is acidosis with a negative five base deficit. Coags for this patient are also abnormal. INR of four, PT of 39. There's even a low fibrinogen normal being 200. The third case is an 11-year-old male, gunshot wound to the head. This was a low caliber handgun, uh, presented with a GCS of 3T. He's tachycardic. Uh, he's desaturating. You can see the chest x-ray on the far right. There's significant pulmonary edema. The image on the left-hand side, the coronal view of non-contrasted CT, we actually see that there is, you know, it, we can see the track in which the bullet traced through the base of the skull. And then the image in the middle, we see the actual bullet fragment 
on the bone view of the CT head. Uh, this patient presented with significant acidosis, pH of 7.1, base deficit of negative 14, elevated lactate of 5. Initial coags were actually normal, um, INR of 1, PT of 13, but over subsequent hours, these did significantly increase. And as the platelet count, you can see at the bottom, this also decreased over a 24-hour period. And then the fourth case is a reference for our discussion. Um, another young child, four-week-old, altered mental status, seizures, a history of a fall from a bed, and the baby was kind of breathing irregular. Um, vital signs are listed at the top right. Uh, the imaging, though, as we see the image on the left, we see there's an abnormality kind of at the inferior portion um, of the skull there. This is actually sliced up more um, superior. Uh, on the sagittal, we see it, or the coronal, you see it a little bit better, but there's an abnormality, uh, especially around that superior sagittal sinus. There's this, this wide opacity there. Now, uh, this was subsequently followed up with MRI imaging, and this child actually had a uh, sagittal venous thrombosis. Um, patient was having lots of seizures. What was abnormal about lab work here was the platelet count was 10. There was lactic acidosis um, from poor perfusion. Um, initial coags were unremarkable, but the fibrinogen level was, was slightly low, 200 being normal. This child's was 185. So with, with this talk, I'd like to discuss for our objectives, the physiology of trauma-induced coagulopathy as it relates to traumatic brain injury in pediatric patients. I'd like to also hit on the challenges of identifying and, and what are we really calling as coagulopathy in these patients. And then we're going to review transfusions as well as hemostatic agents and how we manage these patients. Let's start with a few definitions. So pediatric severe traumatic brain injury. Now, if you recall from previous grand rounds, we had a discussion on, or there was a talk on the mild to moderate kind of the football player, the concussion, you know, that sort of thing. We're taking this a step further. So this is on the severe side, we're talking about patients who present with a GCS of, of typically around three to eight. And this is how a lot of the studies at least classify these patients based on Glasgow Coma Scale. There's typically abnormalities on a CT scan. They're usually out of it, loss of consciousness for greater than 24 hours. And think of this as just, a profound insult to the brain and there's significant microvessel rupture. Why this is important in pediatric trauma? Well, it's the most common cause of death. Um, for many of the mechanisms that you see listed there, car accidents, abusive head trauma, gun violence. Uh, the CDC posted in 2014, there was about 2,500 pediatric deaths related to traumatic brain injury. Virginia uh, statistics kind of include pediatrics and adults, but um, on over that four-year period, we see that there was about 7,000 plus patients who died from traumatic brain injury. Now, this, this slide here is pediatric trauma at Carilion, and it's broken down with a table on the right into traumatic brain injury. Um, I'd like to give a, a shout out to Tanya, our um, pediatric trauma program manager for helping pull this data. Um, so as we see the table on the left, our PEDS, our distribution, you know, less than 15, you know, each year we're at least hitting over 200 patients for that level one criteria for a trauma center for pediatrics. Now we've pulled data for GCS less than eight. Now there's two, there was about 38 patients who presented with a GCS less than eight. Um, so it's about 10 a year, roughly, over the 2017 to 2020 period. And we have broken down kind of mechanism of injury. Motor vehicle is the more common one with about 30% of the patients, followed by falls and then non-accidental. And this would include non-accidental with their presentation being less than eight. And we also have gunshot wound um, all the way down to bicycle and pedestrian. I thought I would include bronchiolitis, or at least a mention of bronchiolitis with this talk, um, more so as a reference to the appraisal, uh, it's, it's to the level of evidence for some of these studies that we're gonna be talking about, uh, to kind of equate it to the 2018, 2019 guidelines for bronchiolitis. So let's take, for instance, on the far right, we see steroids. Um, based on the guidelines, 
we should be avoiding those in bronchiolitis, um, routine bronchiolitis. And that's a that's based on a lot of good quality evidence and strong recommendation. As we go down, we see albuterol here, not you know more so based on systematic reviews for observational studies, not quite as strong of a recommendation that we should be avoiding it, but we all have the general consensus that we should. And then pulse oximetry. So if you see the emoji with the guy with the foggy glasses and the COVID mask on and the guy really struggling to lift that weight, you know, uh, we should not be using pulse oximetry and managing bronchiolitis and that type of recommendation. And then the weakest of all is going to be these these emojis paired together, this expert opinion um, with this with a weak cookie arm, as we'll call it. And that is more so for bronchiolitis, you know, using plus or minus using NG feedings for patients who are admitted inpatient for bronchiolitis. This is the area which we're going to be mostly seeing with the articles that we're talking about today. Now, the management of traumatic brain injury in pediatrics is, is typically broken down into tiers. The first tier is, you know, what we're trying to do in the ICU is prevent increased intracranial pressure. Um, from the, the injury that has already occurred. We're also trying to improve cerebral blood flow and optimize oxygen to that damaged tissue. When those measures fail, we start thinking second tier therapy, such as decompressive craniectomy to actually allow the brain to swell out through um, a cat, you know, the, the opening of the skull so that it doesn't further herniate downward and cause further damage, ultimately leading to brain death when the brain stem is taken out. And then there's other, there's other um, therapies that we consider, such as barbiturate, coma, hypothermia. We're trying to decrease metabolic demands there, hyperventilation to drive CO2 down to affect cerebral vasculature, um, blood flow, and then hyperosmolar therapy. The guidelines do mention and talk about coagulopathy and how to manage these patients, but it's more so summarizing some adult studies, some pediatric studies, and the recommendations are kind of the best part gray, I'll say. So I think it's worth us just touching on a few of those studies. One of the ones that was mentioned, so this is a study, very, very small number. where 12 patients were evaluated, six who, um, as you see in the table, the estimated blood loss was greater than 50% for patients who had a traumatic brain injury and they went to the operating room for a craniectomy. So they were attempting that second tier therapy there. And if there was an INR that was elevated, greater than 1.2, greater than 1.3, those patients tended to lose more than 50% of their blood volume. Now, when they kind of handpicked their you know, comparators, they saw that with a lower, lower INR, that wasn't necessarily the case. This brings us to coagulation. I'd like to give a shout out to the Thrombo Advisor at Twitter.com. I borrowed this slide. I liked its simplicity, but I realize it is a Twitter slide. Um, let's go through this slide here. So if you can look at the left-hand side of the screen where there's an insult to the blood vessel. So we can, we can imagine that trauma has occurred. As we go down, one of the biggest potent um, stimulators for this process for coagulopathy is actually tissue factor. And in the brain, it's called brain tissue factor. And it's a very potent regulator of, you know, causing this cascade of coagulopathy we're going to get into. But as we, as we circle towards actually forming the thrombus on the far lower right hand side of the slide, um, numerous processes are occurring. Platelet adhesion comes into play, and then there's platelet aggregation. We have to activate those platelets, certainly. And then once that occurs, we're getting, you know, from primary hemostasis onto secondary hemostasis, where we're laying down that fibrin mesh to form that clot. Zooming out on this a little bit, we see how it plays clinically. Is it any time in the top left-hand side of the slide, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the where it says trauma, um, anytime this occurs, we get a whole host of things that can happen. Platelet activation, catecholamines, and then the actual endothelium itself being damaged is leaking out these glycoxylate um, factors. We also have hemorrhage. Hemorrhage can create shock states, and that can actually cause a tremendous amount of um, increase in tissue plasminogen. Now, let's think about that. We formed our clot. 
but yet we have tissue plasminogen leaking out. So we're going to get this hyperfibrinolysis potentially there. And patients who present with this state, this hyperfibrinolysis, uh, it's, it's a high mortality. Um, other things that can occur, you know, platelets are being used up, they're dysfunctional, coagulation factors are also decreasing. And then let me draw your attention to an iatrogenic factor as well. Um, this, is, this is what we would say, you know, makes this coagulopathic bleeding worse. And this is hemodilution. So this is giving a patient a lot of normal saline when they're bleeding out. You're diluting the coagulation factors. Also not correcting acidosis. You know, platelets may not function well anytime we're in an acidotic state, as well as if the patient is cold. That's trauma as a whole for trauma-induced coagulopathy. If we talk about the brain itself, you know, this also plays out there, but you can have states of hypocoagulability, such as, you know, hemorrhagic bleeding, but you can also have, you know, this process where you're having actual strokes. If there is, you're forming clots in places that you shouldn't be, or you perhaps are giving product that you shouldn't be, you can actually have infarctions made worse. And then with this slide, I'd have you focus on just the two images at the bottom. So the image on the left shows an individual who had a traumatic brain injury, and you can see the abnormalities there with the, um, the amount of blood, the kind of white findings there, the, the bright findings. Now, over a two to three day window, we see blossoming of the hemorrhagic contusion um, over a certain time frame. So this is what we're talking about for for traumatic brain injury, this blossoming um, is, is the um, coagulation, the coagulopathy associated with that. The next slide is a systematic review. Now, this was mostly looking at adults, and I like this because it was, you know, this guy looked at over 5,000 articles. And he was only really able to use about 33 of them with building this model. And I'm not seeing anyone else do this, but um, so limited data for what he was able to use, and it's mostly based on retrospective studies, but what he showed, has demonstrated here, um, so I'll, I'll draw your attention to the y-axis, so positive value, negative value, so increase versus decrease, and then we'll look at the actual x-axis is the timeline. So within the first 12 hours of a traumatic brain injured patient, what he's kind of teased out is that there was an increase in the D-dimer as well as an increase in our um, PT, PTT, which kind of indicates the D-dimer is somewhat of a surrogate for this hyperfibrinolysis that we're forming a clot and then we're significantly breaking it down early, as well as with the PT is that we're consuming up our coagulation factors in that first day or so. Now, we see the blue line, which is a marker for platelets. Now, the platelets do go down um, over that first 24 hour to 72 hour window, but it wasn't the impression that he, that they gave with this was that it wasn't, you know, like a platelet drop that was, you know, down into single digits. It was more so kind of a mild drop in platelets. Now, there were studies that he included in this that included the actual platelet function. That was more of an impressive decrease um, that the platelets, yes, they may be somewhat in the normal range, but they're actual functioning on these traumatic brain injured adults was actually lower. If we look at pediatric data, and I realize this is a busy slide, but um, you know, this was more so looking at coagulopathy and traumatic brain injury. Um, there's three, three articles here. I'm gonna start with the one on the, the far left-hand side. So these were all retrospective studies. The first one was looking at mortality on the y-axis, and then they broke it into kind of a bar graph here on the x-axis. The isolated traumatic brain injury patient we see with coagulopathy depicted by the white line, the mortality was significantly higher in looking back at these patients. I mean, this is about 300 or so patients that they looked at. Um, this was a US study. The um, study at the bottom, um, I believe was out of Los Angeles. This was a similar thing, coagulation, do we have it or not? And kind of how it's being defined is, you know, an abnormality in the INR, kind of, you know, more so greater than 1 or 1.2, 1.3, platelet count less than 100. They found with the, when they look back at their isolated head um, for pediatrics, there was higher ICU stay, there was higher mortality and hospital duration. 
Um, the folks in Singapore, so this is a this is the um, one that's James and Chong. They looked at patients, but they examined it more so six months out. So somewhat of a prognostic indicator if a patient had traumatic brain injury and coagulopathy was present. And they found based on their Glasgow outcome scores, so kind of just gross, you know, they had moderate dysfunction at six months, mild dysfunction or no function, you know, same function as um, pre-injury. They found that there was a fair amount in that coagulopathy group that had moderate to severe um, dysfunction, which, you know, perhaps this could be somewhat of a surrogate marker prognostically um, with our traumatic brain injury patients is where, you know, we're taking care of them long term and there's a lot of attention on out of ICU care um, and, you know, further down the road. I've included this slide for Dr. Keyes um, and those interested in abusive head trauma. Uh, Christine Leeper, she's in a few of the slides that I've put. They are, um, Pittsburgh's a powerhouse for traumatic brain injury. They publish a lot there. They have a big database. But this is a retrospective study looking at abusive head trauma patients. Over 10 years, they had about 100 patients. And presentation was GCS less than 13. They also had a child abuse team that you know diagnosed abusive head trauma defendable in court you know slam dunk at least they they really felt that that was what the diagnosis was and with the chart there we see that on the y-axis is the percentage for mortality and the INR is on the x-axis you know even even you know what we at least for myself you know small increases in INR on presentation that may you know previously I was not that I was underwhelmed with you know may actually be fairly significant prognostically as we see you know an INR of 1.5 to 1.7 in the middle of the the graph there 50 percent mortality 58 percent and then how that teased out on a receiver operator curve on the image on the right um, based on sensitivity and specificity you know middle line that green line is that there's no you know flip of the coin is how the INR does for predicting mortality this did fairly well um, in, in it. Um, it's, it's an interesting study that they did. INR is, um, has been studied further for just kind of all, all comers pediatric trauma. And, it's been, and there's the scoring tool that is on MD Calc. And I've referenced the Tom Hanks 80, 88, 1988 video here for that. But it uses three factors. It's base deficit, so a marker for poor perfusion. INR for coagulopathy and then Glasgow outcome or Glasgow um, GCS coma score and then it gives you a calculation so I've run some numbers there just just kind of vague numbers and with a patient who presents with with those score uh, it's about a 28 percent mortality I thought this was interesting it's fairly quick and easy to use um, on MD Calc so the question becomes you know we have a patient with an elevated INR and a systolic blood pressure that we're going to say is stable, you know, should we just give FFP? And, you know, the, the answer is, well, I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't know what they put there either, but I will raise some, um, I will include these several studies further, both of them also from Pittsburgh about maybe we shouldn't be giving FFP to these patients who have elevated INR. So if we think back of how we form our clot, we, you know, we get platelet adhesion, we get that fibrin mesh, secondary um, hemostasis, and then we actually need to start breaking down that clot. We don't need to just fully fill up that blood vessel, you know, especially in the brain, we might be causing ischemic infarction, making things worse by giving product. So if we look at the figure three here, at the bottom left, the patients who are in the, um, the dark, bar are those who are traumatic brain injury patients and then they got FFP and this is about 100 or so patients looking, looking retrospectively. We see that the mortality in that in those patients is high, it's higher. The sustained shutdown, so you're shutting down fibrinolysis, it, it occurred in all of these patients when we get FFP and then disability was also much higher. One could also argue that, you know, the severity of disease could factor in there as well. Um, they published another article as well, looking also at shutdown. And um, especially with that first hour window, they were able to get visoelastic assays on these patients. 
Um, and this isn't, this is not just purely traumatic brain injury. This is kind of all comer pediatric trauma. But they, when they, when they found shutdown was present, it was much, there was much higher mortality rate. And then the actual percentage of hyperfibrinolysis for what we're actually trying to treat was actually lower, which I found was interesting. Okay, so let's suppose that our neurosurgical colleagues are at the bedside and we have an exam that is very poor on our patient with severe traumatic brain injury. And the neurosurgeon is requesting us to give case Centra prior to putting a bolt in or an EVD or actually taking the patient to surgery for craniectomy. So should we give case Centra, which is a prothrombin complex to reverse the INR? Yes, no maybe what the heck is case Centra? And I've been in this situation several times, I believe Dr. Powell as well. We, we tended to go with the answer D here on this one. So what the heck is case Centra? Oh, it's a, it's, it's, it's like FFP, but it's, it's really a more concentrated version of it. It is mostly nowadays, it's, it's a four, uh, a four factor concentrate, two, seven, nine, and 10. And it's, it is being advertised as being able to reverse the INR uh, much quicker. You can get it in them quicker than FFP, and it will sustain an INR of less than 1.3 for 8 to 12 hours. Um, its kind of FDA approval label was it's an urgent warfarin reversal. So our neurosur neurosurgical colleagues have a lot of experience with it in dealing with traumatic brain injury patients who are on warfarin. How does this really work out if we were to get a little more granular with our um, coagulation cascade? So it, it not only works on intrinsic, but extrinsic pathway um, in multiple areas where factors may be depleted in a patient with traumatic brain injury with this coagulopathy. Um, as you can see here, these are the yellow. Um, so there's some other circles here, which I'll get into for other adjuncts that we'll also talk about. And I've put the McDonald colored star up here um, recalling tissue factor, that potent contributor to, to um, traumatic brain injury coagulopathy and re potentially replacing factor seven there um, could help with that process. Um, but what is the evidence on this? And in, in pediatrics, I will say it's very scant. Now, the neurosurgical folks, as you see the, the article at the bottom, um, they feel that if you give, if you give uh, case centro, you know, with FFP, you can get patients to the OR quicker. You can get them to have the procedure. You can reverse the INR quicker and potentially mortality will be less. Now that was retrospective data. And then they did actually matching for the, for the cases that they did interventions on. Um, in pediatrics, at least from what I, really all I could find, there's a journal article, uh, British journal, it was kind of interesting. This was at five month old. This is the one at the top. Five month old abusive abdominal trauma, grade five liver laceration, exsanguinating out, multiple, multiple massive transfusion runs, bleeding, bleeding, um, survived the OR, and then in the ICU, continued to ooze from the drains, continued to have elevated INR, and then they had this voila moment when they gave um, a case entry. It was probably a, a, a um, a three factor concentrate instead of four, which we use now. And so that has had some that, that you know, certainly a press release in of one study. And then I found that nationwide. So this is the middle article. They they kind of did just descriptive data here and put it in a research snapshot of about 11 patients over a one year period. Um, and this was if an INR was greater than 1.4. We got to get these kids to the OR for the neurosurgeons to, you know, intervene and potentially save this child's life. Um, and they found that it did correct in, in at least seven of the 11 patients. There were complications of thrombosis and about half of the patients died. So that's FFP and case Centra. When we're talking about um, hemoglobin, you know, a drop, we, we see, we see, we saw this in a few of the cases that I presented and it's not uncommon in the ICU. But what is really the, the transfusion threshold, kind of how, what is really out there to guide us? And what we kind of all have a, an agreement upon is, at least from the folks at the, it's, it's called the, the taxi initiative or the transfusion and anemia expertise. For traumatic brain injury, um, these are experts kind of appraising the literature, doing the work for us. 
it's it's pretty weak, but the suggestion for an acute brain injury with a bleed, um, hemoglobin of seven to ten, you could certainly consider. Kind of how we practice as a whole would be if we're below seven in a peach trauma patient, we're, we're certainly going to consider transfusing. Um, and and kind of why is that? Well, we've certainly evolved to a more stingier regimen for red blood cell and transfusions as a whole. Red blood cells can increase viscosity and decrease blood flow, and certainly to damage tissues that can be an issue. Stored red blood cells can actually have more of a left shift effect on oxygen dissociation, make it more difficult to offload oxygen to damaged tissues. And then there are some of the theoretical potentials, such as it, it is, it's more of a pro-coagulant, pro there's oxidative stress um, coming from some of these micro vesicles. So we're, we're a little bit cautious there for red blood cells. EPO uh, wasn't able to find anything on pediatrics for that, but it does come up. We do discuss it sometimes. Really the only thing out there was a, a JAMA article, randomized controlled trial, about 200 patients, and they really didn't find any difference in outcome looking at six months and giving EPO kind of transfusion threshold seven to 10. They did find out though that, um, or in their study, they found there was um, more deep vein thrombosis in the patients who got EPO. So let's talk about platelets. Now, several of the cases that I presented, there was thrombocytopenia. You know, should we transfuse the patient um, based on a drop from, say, 220 to 98? So we're in this gray area here. And there's, there's really not great evidence, unfortunately, on this. But there is a cons kind of a consensus um, statement from some of the transfusion experts on this looking at uh, traumatic brain injury patients, and even at a level of that kind of 50 to 100 range for thrombocytopenia on the mild to moderate, actually giving those patients platelets really didn't improve outcome. Um, platelets can be a potent um, stimulator for ARDS, um, especially it can influence the pulmonary vasculature, and there's, there's all sorts of side effects for platelet transfusing. And as we recall from that model, that was presented from um, those 33 studies, uh, systematic review. The platelet count does dip down, but it increases after about 72 hours or so. I included this slide just to not forget about our cousin cryo. Um, for traumatic brain injury in adults was the only thing I was able to find. It was more so, let's just not forget about cryo, especially when we're going down a massive transfusion protocol, giving that late anytime there's significant amount of hemodynamic instability and we're committing down massive transfusion protocol, there may be a mortality effect if it's if we forget about cryo. So it's more so recommended to give it if you're going down that direction. Okay, so TXA. So this is this may be something you guys have heard of. Um, it's even in the outpatient world to some of the um, adolescent patients with uh, dysmenorrhea or heavy bleeding. Um, it's been used in ortho as well, and it's popular in trauma. It's a popular topic, especially in the evidence-based realm. How this works is recall that we have fibrin being broken down in excessively. Um, when we have, anytime we have shock or hemorrhagic shock, we're stimulating tissue plasminogen, TPA is leaking out. Well, TXA works to stop that process, to stabilize the clot. And I've included a penny in this because this is dirt cheap. This is um, something that EMS can give. This is something that has been gained momentum, especially in war torn countries, for being able to provide it in the field. And we do know that hyperfibrinolysis, so that rapid breakdown in adults is bad, in pediatrics is bad as well. Um, there is a much higher mortality. And then if we look, you know, six months out is the study. Um, for the Glasgow outcome scale, patients who had more hyperfibrinolysis, they had more functional um, poor outcomes at the six month period. So the evidence on this, we have to unfortunately tap into a lot of the adult studies here, but these landmark um, or at least well talked about studies that you may have heard of, CRASH-2 at the bottom was published in Lance in 2010. 20,000 something patients, uh, randomized control trial. This is giving trauma patients at risk for severe bleeding, 
TXA versus placebo within the eight hour window. They found a survival benefit, um, but you needed to treat about 67 patients in order to prevent one death. We go 10 years later, um, roughly to looking at, okay, trauma patients, but let's look at trauma patients with traumatic brain injury and in giving TXA. So this is the middle article, the crash three. They moved the timeline to sooner, less than three hours giving this, and they looked at all, all head injury related mortality and then um, head injury related mortality and then all cause mortality. In the all cause, there was no difference, but when they kind of reanalyzed their data in a subgroup, they found that the mild to moderate head injury, GCF nine to 15, there was a benefit with using that, meaning that you know the patients that we're talking about, these severe patients, GCS less than eight, you know, giving TXA likely would not benefit. And the JAMA article was published last year at the top, as you see, not as many patients, but they looked at the specifically the severe head injury patients, GCS less than 12, who were hemodynamically stable, and they found no difference at six months follow-up. Factor seven comes up and it gets discussed, especially in the pediatric trauma world, um, where factor seven plays in, if you recall, in the extrinsic pathway um, with tissue factor there um, significantly leaking out of damaged tissue, stimulating, um, you know, the ability for us to try to form clots and get damage control, you know, intrinsically on this. Um, you can imagine factor seven makes biological plausibility that this would get depleted. Um, there's another interesting kind of end of one case release, case or media case report release of the, the bottom you see there, the 1999 case report. It was a British soldier rifle, high velocity rifle, tore through the IVC, profoundly acidotic, massive transfusion. They were throwing the whole kitchen sink at this patient. And then of course, someone suggested, let's give factor seven. They gave two doses and then this coagulopathic bleeding um, got better and um, there was return to normal of INR and PT, um, essentially hemostasis. In pediatrics, um, there was a five-year review that wasn't really powered for one flavor of type of uh, mechanism of injury, but they had bone marrow, transplant, sepsis, and trauma. And they more so just reported their, their familiarity and some of their outcomes with factor seven or Novo seven. And um, there was some clotting that they noticed. There was one patient who had to have a leg amputated. They suggested that there was a decreased blood product usage. So there may be something to this. And then with our adult colleagues, um, similar thing, they did a six year cost analysis looking backwards. We have to always be cautious on cost analysis studies. There's a lot of limitations to that, but they felt that you could save a fair amount of money by giving Novo 7. You could decrease length of stay, mechanical ventilation later days. There's really no effect on mortality, and they didn't really see the deep vein thrombosis that we saw in the, the pediatric study. DDAVP, um, it's worth mentioning that, uh, how this works, um, and it's kind of more so popular with a patient with hemophilia or von Willenbrand disease, who is bleeding or possibly needs surgery, especially neurosurgery, in giving this medication. There's not a lot out there for patients who don't have that condition or patients who are, you know, say your patient who's on aspirin. So this could be a congenital heart kid or a kid taking aspirin for some other reason or a patient on Plavix. Um, this kind of works through sodium and calcium, um, kind of enhancing that fluctuation to overall improve platelet adhesion. The consensus on that um, from the Neurocritical Care Society is that we should really only consider that for patients who are on aspirin and Plavix. As it does come up, there are side effects. You know, if you're improving your platelet adhesion, and, and as we saw on those other slides about that model for platelet improvement within a couple day window, you may be more likely to have actually thrombosis or deep vein thrombosis and uh, complications. So back to the guidelines, I realize we're, we've got a lot of slides here. Um, we've looked at some of those articles. Their, their approach to this is, well, coagulopathy, we should address active bleeding and we should titrate it based on a thromboelastogram. 
So what is a thromboelastogram? Now, Dr. Leal presented a morning report on this on a patient who had a massive transfusion protocol activation, and this was used to kind of help guide um, more so goal-directed therapy, of which, which product do we need to give, FFP or cryo? And a just a real quick reminder of how this works. So this is taking blood from the body, putting it in a little cup, as we see in the image on the far right, spinning it around, and then using sensors to measure how well the body or how well the blood is forming a clot. And it will print out an image here, as we see, that looks like a teardrop, and some will describe it as a champagne flute. But as we form a clot, we look at the time of which we start. So a flat line is no signal at all. We're not forming a clot. If it takes longer to do so, we may consider giving FFP. Now, once we form our clot, we get an angle. If the angle is abnormal and small, we may need to give cryo. And then, hey, we formed our clot at the top. It's the actual MA or the maximum amplitude. If that is low, then perhaps our platelets are low, perhaps our platelets are dysfunctional. Maybe we should consider giving platelets. We have now formed our clot. We now need to break it down. And that's where the lysis comes in. If we are over lysing our clot, hyperfibrinolysis, then perhaps TXA would be something useful in those types of patients. Where this gained popularity in adults, and it is, depending on which center you talk to, this should be how we manage adult trauma patients, is that they should have these studies done as soon as they um, come into the trauma bay, is that there was a survival benefit at six hours um, if patients were randomized into an arm of being managed with thromboelastogram as compared to sort of the conventional assays, the INR, the PT, the platelets. They found that they gave less actual plasma or FFP with those patients, but there was somewhat of a teased out of a mortality benefit. So that's gained some popularity. In pediatrics, um, there's one study that shows, um, this is the article on the right, that you can actually get the sample back quicker and be able to make decisions on it faster than say your INR, your PT, um, and, you know, your platelets and making those decisions. I question that. I've not necessarily seen that be the case here, but it, it, it seems promising. Now, if you were to ask what are the limitations to this visoelastic assay, um, so we're taking blood out of the body. We're not factoring in the effect of the endothelium, so endothelial damage. There is also other things behind the scenes going on with the way platelets adhere to each other and the effects of von Willenbrand. The sample itself is ran at 37 degrees. So if you have a patient that's down and cold, you may you may offshoot based on your interpretation. And what if the the tag is abnormal or the rotem is abnormal, and the patient's not bleeding? And I'll show you an example here. This was actually a recent one we did in the ICU. Um, let's just look at the abnormal lab values here. So the clotting time very high. So that would suggest maybe we need to give FFP. That's impressively high alpha angle very low perhaps we need to give cryo and then the amplitude of which we form our clot is low that would suggest we need to give platelets um, the lysis was um, normal so txa is unlikely now this was a patient who um, it was a uh, leukemic patient very sick covid on the ventilator um, not not significantly bleeding but definitely oozy um, and we're trying to make decisions using this well what happened to this sample was actually sit down the tube system and, and shaken around. And so interpretation of this, unfortunately, um, it, it, it didn't help out. So let's go back to our cases real quick as we summarize. The two-year-old, if you recall, who was ejected and had a GCS of 3T, very impressive skull fracture, intraventricular hemorrhaging, massive cerebral edema and soft tissue swelling. If you recall, she was hypotensive. She was given fluids. She was started on dopamine. She was transfused. This was the patient that, oh, by the way, INR is elevated, neurosurgery is at the head of the bed, starting to drill a bolt in for a monitor and then walks away based on the INR. We did end up giving Kcentra to this patient because it was a kitchen sink approach to trying to be able to reverse everything as quick and as fast as possible. 
cryo was also given as well as platelets. Now I've included a chart at the bottom right. Um, with that approach, within a four hour window, we were able to reverse her INR, her PT also corrected. Um, her platelets continued to dip down, so she received another um, round of platelets and the fibrinogen level was well above 200. Um, at that four hour window, we were able to get an intracranial pressure monitor and as we expected, it was very elevated. Um, normal ICP should be around, we're targeting roughly 20 and try to get it below that. This was 79 and this is 79 with maximizing medical management for those you know, various tiers for ICP management. Um, and an EVD was then placed in an attempt to try to drain off some cerebral spinal fluid to lower ICP and get a better um, gauge of intracranial pressure, but it remained in the 50s to 80 range. And then by hour 11 from her presentation, she had a craniectomy and she only lost about 75 cc's of blood. Now, if you were to ask me kind of how is this child doing kind of long term, um, I will say she did survive her hospital stay. This was a picture taken about a year later. Um, she required extensive neuro rehab, uh, physical therapy, and for which she's still ongoing. Um, this was an injury that happened about three, two and a half, three years ago. And um, I touched base with the mom a few weeks ago. She's starting to take a few steps, but she's very much dependent on her caregivers and her mother, um, but it was an interesting case um, and her, uh, she ended up surviving. The two-year-old um, that we presented with these lab abnormalities, if you recall, had the subdural. Um, the INR was four, the PT was off, fibrinogen was low, and a platelet count of 30. Seemed pretty strange. So uh, having seen this, we actually got a, a Rotem on the patient, and the Rotem was actually normal. And so that was unusual. There was no issues with that would indicate we would need to give product based on that. And then, hey, let's recheck our labs. Well, here was the issue. So we actually had lab abnormalities. So the INR was actually one on the repeat. PT was normal and the platelet count was actually 330 and not 30. Um, this patient uh, by day two did receive a blood transfusion for the hemoglobin dropping below seven. Um, was intubated for 24 hours, had a significant amount of seizures, multi anti epileptics were used, stayed in the ICU for seven days. There was retinal hemorrhaging seen on one of the eyes all the way out to the aura serrata, and a definition of abusive head trauma was diagnosed. The patient with a gunshot wound to the head, um, very critical patient who. Um, ultimately um, had significant coagulopathy as, as time went by. You know, the INR was one on presentation. It was actually rechecked with an ISTAT, which was off, um, but it certainly was still abnormal. The, the, when it was sent down to the lab, instead of a point of care at the bedside, it was still 1.6. You know, I've talked to Dr. Apple about this, you know, what is her threshold for being comfortable intervening, uh, putting a drain in, ICP, taking a child to the OR based on INR, and that 1.4 to 1.6 range, um, if we're able to correct, would be much more favored. Um, you know, kids herniating, dying, you know, right away, who cares about the INR, that, that's also on the table as well. And this child did get K-Centra, did get FFP, platelet count did dwindle down, um, unfortunately, you know, ICPs remained elevated in the 30s with this patient, despite maximizing medical management. Um, after 24 hour, 40 hour window, the family actually decided to redirect care and the child died. The four week old who presented with seizures, altered mental status and a fall from the bed. Um, this is the case that had the abnorm abnormal subdural that was, and it was a good pickup by our neurosurgical colleagues, especially image on the far right. We see that there's some irregularities around that superior sagittal sinus. So that prompted further workup for an MRV, which showed the superior sagittal venous thrombosis. Now, this child also had a platelet count of 10, if you recall, on admission. Now, that was rapidly rechecked, and it was actually 215. It was normal. 
with this child's care, we further pursued a non-accidental workup. Retinal hemorrhaging was seen bilaterally all the way out to the kind of anterior area to the aura serrata. Um, this is an interesting case because I haven't had many of these where you have a sinus venous thrombosis and you actually commit, despite having a subdural and retinal hemorrhaging, you commit to actually anticoagulating these patients as the priority becomes preventing that thrombosis at the superior sagittal sinus from getting worse. By day three, um, the child did receive a red blood cell transfusion, PRVC, um, did, I think, left the unit on three anti-epileptics. We had a lot of trouble in the first 24 to 48 hours with seizures, seven days in the units, and then ultimately um, was discharged into foster care after leaving the hospital. Okay, for my two, as we, we finish here, for my two MOC questions, um, we'll start off with a five-year-old male with suspected isolated severe traumatic brain injury from a motor vehicle accident, presents in the trauma bay, GCS of 3T, tachycardic, hypotensive, what intervention should be done next? And I will pull up the chat for everyone and the answer A is to obtain a CT head, B would be an MRI, C would be a Rotem and an INR, D would be normal saline bolus, and E would be to transfuse the patient, 20 cc's per kilo of PRBCs. Let's see. Do we have any, any answers? Okay, Dr. Tomez, who is very reliable, I've noticed for grand rounds, especially answering these questions. So A, any residents out there? Dr. Leal, thank you. Tanya says C, blood pressure is low. Yes, I, I, I'm gonna go, and Dr. Hinchel says D. Um, so you, you could go multiple ways here. Um, I. I tried to word this in a way to where the blood pressure being low on a child, especially a five-year-old, you know, two times the age would put him as a value of 10, 10 plus 70 from our PALS classes. So we, we should be a systolic in the 80s. So I didn't give any background and say that we've already given any anything to this child, but if we've hit at least um, 20 cc's to 40 cc's per kilo, according to the American College of Surgeons for Peds Trauma, then we should move on to transfuse for red blood cells. So for the initial step, um, the answer was D for what I chose. Question two, which of the following are considered the lethal triad, somewhat of an iatrogenic influence for potentially worsening coagulopathy in pediatric traumatic brain injury patient? This one needs a little bit of a slower approach to. So answer A would be hypothermia, alkalosis, giving blood. B would be high blood, hypertension, acidosis, transfusing FFP. Um, C, hyper, hypothermia, acidosis, a dilutional effect. D, low blood pressure, TXA. And then E, we threw in steroids there. All right, I like what I'm seeing, guys. I'm seeing a lot of C's, and that's the answer, um, at least from this talk. To summarize, with just a few minutes left, coagulopathy and the severe traumatic brain injury, it's likely a poor, it's likely a surrogate marker for poor outcome. Um, more work needs to be done on that and a lot of other things. Um, the lethal triad, which we mentioned, we want to try to avoid that when we're managing these patients immediately in the ICU and long-term is it can make coagulopathy worse. And I didn't present to you, but one of the, um, one of the studies from Pittsburgh, they actually looked at kind of, it was not their primary um, out outcome, but they looked at INR and bleeding time. And there was a poor correlation with that. And so, it's, it's making us think a little bit more about just because an INR is elevated, do we necessarily need to give product to, to correct that? Um, and it may not be a nine thing if we're over transfusing some patients. Um, the Rotem offers us a potential tool, extra tool to kind of 
make a little bit more of an informed decision. I'm a little bit biased. We use this a lot in our ECMO patients, even though we, we didn't really know what to do with it, but we had a lot of this experience with it and trying to figure out what to do with it. And that's, I gave that a cookie arm um, weak recommendation there. And then for our hemostatic adjuncts, I would say in the mild to moderate traumatic brain injury patient, especially if there's hemodynamic instability. So these are patients with, you know, head injury, plus maybe there's a femur, pelvic fracture, or hemodynamically unstable, I think is a fairly reasonable medication to give. Um, if you have a lower GCS and this is more severe, it's unlikely to improve outcome. But if they're hemodynamically unstable, I wouldn't fault our EMS colleagues, our ED colleagues from giving that, especially hemodynamically unstable. Um, the prothrombin complex uh, concentrates such as uh, Kcentra, you know, it may not be the right thing to do from a biological standpoint. It does make sense, but, you know, it could lead to more at the microvascular level, more thrombosis and causing worsening stroke. But if we're needing to have a neurosurgical intervention, the kid's borderline um, herniating, this has been shown to reverse INR much quicker than just purely FFP and the time we have to wait to get it from blood bank and to actually administer and it's advertised and we, we're gaining some experience in pediatric ICU with using this. So it could potentially be something that we uh, may be beneficial. It, it, it can be somewhat beneficial for convincing our neurosurgical colleagues that, hey, our INR is this. Do you feel comfortable taking them to the OR or putting in a, in a bolt or a drain? We need more data as a whole for a lot of these things. And with that, I'll, I'll take and welcome any questions you guys have. I realize that was a lot, um, but that was more so the kind of the mystery behind at least what we understand for the time being for traumatic brain induced coagulopathy in the pediatric patient. Yeah, so, so yeah, for Dr. Tomez, you know, this does come up for, um, especially like Novo 7. Um, I've had some experience using that with pulmonary hemorrhaging and um, actually in using it as an inhalational agent. Um, is something to consider. And, and then obviously, if we've got, you know, your CF patient who's got, who's coughing up blood um, or, you know, unknown reasons for uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. There is some literature out there that suggests that, but it's really kind of that that cookie arm um, strength of recommendation in some of the different societies for you know managing those patients with pulmonary bleeding. Um, but it's it's a good yeah it's good to review these things from time to time to see if anything else new has come out. But thank you guys. I appreciate um, your attention, and um, you guys. Have